Welcome back to the discussion, Protecting Data in a Connected World, sponsored by Recorded Future on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. My guest today is Levi Gundert, Vice President of Intelligence and Risk at Recorded Future, and I'm your moderator, Scott Massioni. So before we went to a break, we were talking a little bit about how you can protect yourself. You're saying that uh, some um, in disinformation groups will embed with polarizing groups. So when you're reading an article online or you're looking at something, uh, you know, a meme or anything like that, how can you uh, be a critical thinker and know, uh, you know, what is information and what is disinformation? That's a great question. I think if you're on social media, the first thing you have to do is just take a step back from the social media platform and sort of ask yourself, where did this article originate? It's interesting, we see some of the tactics used domains that are very similar to legitimate media outlets will be used in some of these campaigns. So the name will look or sound familiar even though it's actually slightly different than mm. the legitimate domain. So it's important to sort of understand where's the source here. And then it's always good to try and cooperate with at least one or two what I would call real media institutions or organizations that generally have pretty high standards in terms of the way that they report, the way that they dig into facts, the way that they cooperate, you know, those sorts of things. And it is getting trickier and trickier to sort of define what a legitimate media organization is. And I think that's part of the problem. But I think when you're online, and especially when you're in sort of the echo chamber that is a social media platform, it's really important to sort of think through whatever you're reading or you're watching or you're hearing, there, there is a, a very legitimate potential that it's not either not real or it's not truthful. When it comes to larger organizations, uh, you know, they're also affected industry, uh, government agencies. How can it, they work together to, to kind of stamp this out as well? Yeah, so when you talk about digital risk, this is definitely something that we at Recorded Futures see sort of permeating that, that topic for operational defenders and information security really need to think through how are you monitoring for new domains that are being registered that may attempt to mimic your brand, that may attempt to engage in some sort of disinformation uh, using something close to your brand. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really important to be monitoring open sources and social media, obviously for things like sentiment analysis around your brand, but also looking at things like domains and what's being registered and who's using them and what's sort of happening subsequent to those domains being registered. You can imagine that right now, if criminals are offering disinformation as a service and it's sort of being democratized for anybody to use, you can imagine that there may be more and more companies or organizations that d decide to use those types of services. And maybe they don't go into the dark web to actually find those services. Maybe they're using companies, again, that put a little bit more of a, a legitimate veneer on it. But you can imagine that if company A starts to spin up campaigns against company B in a sort of knowingly malicious way, you know, you, you want to be able to identify and, and detect those. And obviously, in-house counsel would most likely want to get involved in, in potentially taking action. The things on the, the internet, so properties like domains, those, are, those, those things can be taken down. And I think that's really where you need to have a, a proactive stance as, as an organization to realize that uh, you could be targeted for, for those types of um, information operations. So that's when you look out for you know, whitehouse.org instead of .gov and, and things like that. Exactly. And, and what are the options for prosecuting, especially when it goes across international lines? And, and you know, I mean, it seems like it's very messy. It's very difficult to prosecute something like that when you first have to obtain attribution for who's actually behind it. It takes a lot of time and a lot of resources. Um, and then, to your point, if attribution is in a foreign country, it's going to make any sort of criminal prosecution very difficult, especially because in some of these other countries, there are no laws being broken. So it, it, it's quite a, a gray area. And I think, you know, even in our own country, you're looking at the criminal code, you know, you, I think you'd be hard pressed on some of this to find district attorneys or assistant United States attorneys that, you know, have very black and white interpretations of, of what's going on here with influence operations. So it sounds like a, a lot of the options that, that the government has and industry has is, is really uh, preventative and, and informa informing people correctly, right? Absolutely. And, and so, you know, what are sort of the next steps that 
um, you know, the government and industry can can kind of take. I mean, um, you know, should they have training campaigns? Um, should they, um, you know, work together in different ways, share information about, uh, you know, actors and things like that? Yeah, I think, you know, that's where threat intelligence really comes uh, to the forefront. And, you know, we talk again about digital risk a little bit, but threat intelligence is really, I think, first and foremost, one of the the tools in the toolbox that's going to allow organizations to have better visibility into who may be targeting them or you know what may be going on at any point in time you know especially with online platforms and I think you know that's where Recorded Future is is very involved in trying to bring um, better and deeper data into threat intelligence capabilities you know for these organizations um, so they can have better visibility and you know they can have the playbook on standby, you know, which is, is sort of documenting the steps you're going to take when you do identify um, these types of disinformation campaigns. And are these different these disinformation campaigns? Do they have issues with cybersecurity as well? I mean, are you more uh, apt to maybe get a virus or you know find your way into a phishing campaign when you're doing these uh, looking at these kind of articles? So I don't think we've seen a, a super strong nexus between cyber harm. Uh, or impacting you know networks in, in a malicious way, I think there are obviously separate campaigns mm -hmm. that are run by the same organizations at a national level uh, in in foreign countries. But there, we haven't seen the intersection between disinformation and malicious code. Great. Well, Levi, it's been a, a pleasure talking to you. Really appreciate your time today. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Great. I'd like to thank my guest again, Levi Gunder. He's the Vice President of Intelligence and Risk at Recorded Future. I'm your moderator, Scott Massioni, and you're listening to Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search Recorded Future.